Part 9 of Astounding Stories, January 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories, January 1930. Part 9 Phantoms of Reality. Chapter 10 My Role to Play. I slipped like a shadow through the almost empty corridors. Down on the lower floor I found that many of the soldiers were on the inside, standing about the corridors in groups, waiting for word from their comrades on the platform to indicate what action they should take. My time was short. I knew that within a few minutes they would be rushing up to overpower Derrick. I stood unseen against the wall near the main entrance. I could not get outside. There were too many soldiers there. I tried to keep my sense of direction. The wing upon which the tower stood was about two hundred feet from me here. If I could not get outside, I would have to try the inside along this corridor. I prayed that I might not make an error. I tried to gauge exactly where the tower would be. The hallway was almost dark, and in this wing there chanced to be no one at the moment. I came to the angle and turned it to the left. I was unarmed save my dirk. I drew it. But I encountered no one. I passed the doors of many empty rooms. The windows were all barred on this lower floor. I could hear the shouts of the crowd outside. I came at last to the end of the wing. A staircase here led upward. I guessed that I was directly under the tower now and that this staircase undoubtedly led upward into it. I mounted a few steps to verify what I was sure would be the condition. It was as I thought. Robar had won over the soldiers who were here. He had sent them down from the tower bridge. They were guarding this staircase. I crept up another few steps, very cautiously. I could hear their voices on the stairs. A light was up there. I could see the legs of some of them as they crowded the stairs. I softly retreated. There was no way of getting up into the tower here. Alone, and armed only with my dirk, I could not mount these stairs and assail a dozen armed men standing above me. Especially when, if I raised an alarm, Robar overhead might be startled into killing hope. I stood another moment thinking, planning my actions. I was trembling. Everything depended upon me now. I must get up into the tower. And above everything, haste was necessary. I retreated back to the lower floor. I was still some twenty feet above the ground, I judged. That was too far. A dozen paces along the hall I saw a stairway leading downward into the ground-level cellar of the castle. I marked in my mind exactly in which direction I turned and how far. I went down the stairs. There was an empty lower room. It was pitch black. I lay down on its earthen floor. Above me, a few paces off to one side, I could visualize the tower. A hundred and fifty feet above me, at least, up to that bridge balcony where Robar stood with hope. I kept my mind on it and prayed that I might not be making an error, a miscalculation. I prayed, too, that luck would be with me. A desperate chance, yet I thought I knew what was here, or about here, in New York City. I lay on my side, alone in the blackness, and pressed the switch at my wrist. The familiar sensation of the transition began. The darkness grew luminous. Around me shadows were taking form. My body was humming, thrilling with the vibrations within it. I could feel the ground under me seeming to melt. My head was reeling. Nausea swept me, but with it all I tried to keep my wits. I must watch this new space into which I was going. Space? I prayed that here on this spot in New York City there would be empty space. If not, at the first warning, I was prepared to stop my mechanism. The shadows grew around me. 
There was a moment or two when I felt as though I were floating, weightless. The sense of my body hovered in a void, intangible, imponderable, with only my struggling mentality holding it together. And then I felt myself materializing. Around me walls were taking form. I floated down a foot or two and came to rest upon a new floor. My hand brushed it. My physical senses were returning. I could feel a floor of concrete. A vague, shimmering light was near me. It seemed to outline the rectangle of a window. All around was darkness. Empty darkness. Soundless, with only the throbbing hum of the mechanism. I was indoors, in a room. I felt suddenly almost normal, except for the whirring vibration. I flung the switch again. There was a shock, a whirling of my senses. Then I sat up. My head steadied. The nausea passed. I was back in my own world, in New York City. This was night. I tried to calculate the time. Derek and I had departed about midnight. This would be, then, some time before dawn. I was in a cellar room, lying on its cement floor. There was a window, with a faint light outside it. A window up near the ceiling. A straggling illumination showed me a bin, a few barrels, a door leading into another room which looked as though it might be a machine shop. I sat up, calculating. I was a thousand feet, perhaps, from Battery Wall, two hundred feet from the Hudson River. This was an office building, and I was in one of its cellar rooms at the ground level. Near dawn, I tried to calculate what might be overhead. A deserted office building. Too early yet for the scrub women. The elevator would not be running. I laughed to myself. Of what use to me an elevator, if it had been running? How could I, a midnight prowler, appear from the cellar of this building and demand to be taken upstairs? There would be no elevator, but there would be watchmen. I would avoid them. I found a door. My heart leapt with a sudden fear that it would be locked, but it was not. I went through it into a passage and found the staircase. I made two turns. I tried again to keep my mind on this space here. I stood carefully thinking. I had it clear. I had made no move without careful thought. The tower with Robar was still to my left, and about directly above me. I went up the short stone staircase, opened another door carefully. I was in the dim lower hall of the office building. I found myself beside the deserted elevator shaft. A light was burning on the night attendant's table in an alcove on the other side of the shaft. He sat there with his back to me. I closed the door soundlessly. The stairway upward beside the elevator was here. I watched my chance. I darted around the angle and went up. I met no one. The concrete staircase had a light at each floor. Four floors up. No, not enough. I opened the fourth floor door. The marble hall of the office building was empty and silent. Rows of locked office doors with their gold-leaf names and numbers. A single dim light to illumine the silent emptiness. I retreated into the staircase shaft and mounted higher. My dirk was in my hand. Charlie Wilson, the Wall Street brokerage clerk, prowling here. And upon what a strange adventure! I came to what I thought was the proper floor. In the hall I selected a room. The door was securely locked. I had no way of breaking the lock, but the panel was of opaque glass. I would have to chance the noise. I rushed the length of the hall to where a red fire-axe hung in a bracket. I came back with it. I smashed the glass panel of the door. Would a watchman hear me? I did not wait to find out. With the axe I scraped away the splinters of glass. I climbed through the opening. My hand was cut, but I did not heed it. I was in a dim, silent office with rugs on the floor, desks standing about, 
filing cases, a water cooler, and a safe in the corner. I rushed to one of the windows. It looked over Battery Park and the Upper Bay. The stars were shining, but to the east over Brooklyn I could see them paling with the coming dawn. I gazed down to try and calculate my height. Yes, this would be about right. And my position. I could see the outline of the shore, the trees of Battery Park, the busy harbor, even at this hour before dawn, thronged with the moving lights of its boats. I saw all this with my eyes, but with my mind I saw the wrecked, deserted pavilion, and the gardens of Leonto's castle. The threatening mob would be below me. The palace entrance would be here to my left, down in the street where those taxis were parked. There was a commotion down there by the office building entrance. I know now what caused it, but at the time I did not notice. The wing of the castle was under me. This would be the tower, its upper room, or the balcony, just about where I was standing. I prayed that it might be so. I seemed with my mind to see it all. I lay down on the floor by the window. Out in the office building hallway I heard heavy footsteps come running. One of the night watchmen had evidently heard the glass crashed. I laughed. I pressed the switch at my wrist. Chapter 11 The Fight on the Tower Balcony The sensation swept me again. The room faded. Whether the watchman came in to see a ghost of me lying there on the floor, I did not know, nor did I care. I whirled into the shadows, and came in a moment out of the black silence. The office room was gone. I seemed to have fallen or floated down. How far, I do not know. A triumph swept me. I was lying on another floor. I could see a doorway materializing. I was not upon the balcony, as I had calculated, but within the tower room. New walls sprang around me. I did not heed at this time the sensation of the transition. I was too alert to what new situation might come upon me. The tower room. I could see it. I could see its oval windows close at hand. The doorway to its balcony. Sounds flooded me, mingled with the humming within me familiar sounds, the crowd shouting, and a single voice, the voice of Robar, vague and blurred, but as I materialized it became clearer. I was suddenly aware that there was a man beside me, one of the palace soldiers. He saw me materialize. He leapt backward in horror. I flung my switch. I was on my feet, swaying, and then I leapt upon him. My dirk plunged downward into his chest. The thing made me shudder. I reeled with the sickness of it, but as he fell I clung to the dirk and ripped it out of him. It was dripping with his blood. I stood trembling. The small tower room had no other occupants. I turned toward the door. I could see a patch of stars, paling with the coming dawn. I crouched in the small doorway which gave onto the balcony, staring, swiftly calculating. The scene had scarcely changed. But some of the soldiers had left the entrance platform, gone, no doubt, into the castle on their way upstairs to seize Derrick. On this upper balcony, no more than ten feet before me, Robar still stood gripping Hope. She was in front of him. His back was to me. A sudden jump, and I could plunge my dagger into his back. Robar was shouting, King Leonto is dead. If you should want me to succeed him, I will take this girl hope for my queen. You all love her. I was tense to spring. Then, out in the balcony, to one side, I saw Sensua crouching. Her crimson robe fell away to bare her white limbs. Her hand fumbled in her robe. She had been Robar's dupe, and now she knew it. Her knife was in her hand. Frenzied with jealousy and rage, she sprang upon Robar's back, trying to stab at Hope. 
Perhaps he sensed her coming, heard her, or perhaps she was unskillful. Her knife only grazed Hope's shoulder. He released Hope. He roared. He turned and gripped his murderous assailant. A second or two, while I stood watching. He caught Sensua's wrist, twisted the knife from it, and plunged the knife into her breast. She sank with a scream at his feet, and as he straightened, he saw me. But I had leapt. I was upon him. His own knife had remained in Sensua's breast. As I raised mine in my leap, he caught my wrist, twisted it, but I flung the knife away before he could get it. The knife fell over the balcony rail. The weight of my hurtling body flung him backward, but the rail caught him. His arms went around me. Powerful arms, crushing me. I gripped at his throat. There was an instant when I thought that we would both topple over the railing. I felt hope beside us. I heard her scream. We did not go over the rail, for Robar lurched and flung us back. We dropped to the balcony floor, rolling, locked together. He was far stronger and heavier than I. He came uppermost. He lunged and broke my hold upon his throat. But I was agile. I squirmed from under him. I almost regained my feet. He got up on one knee. He was trying to draw his sword. Then again I bore into him, kicking and tearing. He roared like a bull. And, ignoring my plucking fingers, my flailing fists, he lunged to his feet with me gripping again at his throat. His huge weight swung me off the ground. I was aware that he had drawn his sword, but I was too close for him to use it. He swayed drunkenly with my weight. He was confused. I felt the rail behind us. We lunged again into it. Again I heard Hope scream in terror, and saw her leap at us. Robar stooped, trying to clutch at the low rail. His bending down brought my feet to the balcony floor. With a last despairing effort I shoved him backward, and, as he toppled at the rail, I fought to break his hold upon me. I felt us going, and then I felt Hope reach me. Her arms flung about my waist. Her hold tore me loose. Robar's huge body fell away. For an instant, Robar seemed balanced upon the rail. Then he went over. He gave a last, long, agonized scream as he fell. I did not look down. I crouched by the rail. The crowd in the garden, Derek standing on the other balcony, the soldiers who now appeared behind him, all were silent. And in the silence I heard the horrible thud of Robar's body as it struck. I clung to hope for an instant, and she shuddered against me. The scene broke again into chaos. I cast hope away and leapt up. I stood at the balcony rail. My arms went up and gestured to Derek. Amazement was on his face, but he answered my gesture. Behind him the soldiers who had come to seize him were standing in a group, stricken at this new tragedy. Derek swung on them. He was not powerless now. "'Away with you!' His cylinder menaced them, and they fell back in terror before him. He darted past them and disappeared into the castle. I felt hope plucking at me. "'I want to talk to the people!' She stood beside me, leaning over the rail. Gentle little figure, familiar figure to them all, their beloved hope. Her voice rang out clearly through the hush. "'My people, we all want our beloved Alexander. He has come back to us. He is our rightful king.' "'King Alexander! Long live King Alexander!' Derek in a moment appeared behind us. "'My God, Charlie, I can't understand.' I told him how I had done it. He gripped me. "'I'll never be able to repay you for this.' I pushed him forward, and he joined Hope at the rail. He held her, and her arms went around his neck as she returned his kisses. The crowd gaped, then cheered. I shouted, "'Hope will be your queen!' The reign of the Crimson Nobles is at an end!" 
the wild cheering of the people, in which now the castle guards were joining, surged up to mingle with my words. Chapter 12 One Tumultuous Night I come now with very little more to record. I returned to my own world, and Derrick stayed in his. Each to his own. One may rail at this allotted portion, but he does not lightly give it up. The scientists who have examined the mechanism with which I returned very naturally are skeptical of me. Derrick feared a further communication between his world and mine. He smiled his quiet smile. Your modern world is very aggressive, Charlie. I would not want to chance having my mechanism duplicated, a conquering army coming in here. And so he adjusted the apparatus to carry me back and then go dead. I have wires and electrodes to show in support of my narrative, but since they will not operate I cannot blame my hearers for smiling in derision. Yet there is some contributing evidence. Derek Mason has vanished. A watchman in an office building near Battery Park reports that at dawn of that June morning he heard splintering glass. He found the office door with its broken panel and the axe lying on the hall floor. He even thinks he saw a ghost stretched out by the window. But he is laughed at for saying it. And there is still another circumstance. If you will trouble to examine the newspaper files of that time, you will find an occurrence headed, Inexplicable Tragedy at Battery Park. You will read that near dawn that morning the bodies of three men in crimson cloaks came hurtling down through the air and fell in the street near where several taxis were parked. Strange, unidentified men. Of extraordinary aspect. The flesh burned, perhaps. All three were dead. The bodies were mangled by falling some considerable height. An inexplicable tragedy. Why should anyone believe that they were the three crimson nobles whom Derrick attacked with his strange ray? I am only Charles Wilson, a clerk in a Wall Street brokerage office. If you met me, you would find me a very average, prosaic sort of fellow. You would never think that deeds of daring were in my line at all. Yet I have lived this one strange, tumultuous night, and I shall always cherish the memory. The End of Phantoms of Reality by Ray Cummings <laughs>